drainage and the desert. What chews on bones refuses to pause, it's only a matter of time. This is what keeps me going, I hold on to Padma. Padma is what matters Padma muscles, Padma's hairy forearms, Padma my own pure lotus, who, embarrassed, commands, enough. Start. Start now. Yes, it must start with the cable. Telepathy set me apart, telecommunications dragged me down. Amina Sinai was cutting Verukas out of her feet when the telegram arrived, once upon a time. No, that won't do, there's no getting away from the date. My mother, right ankle on left knee, was scooping corn tissue out of the sole of her foot with a sharp-ended nail file on September 9, 1962. And the time. The time matters, too. Well, then, in the afternoon. No, it's important to be more. At the stroke of three o'clock, which, even in the north, is the hottest time of day, a bearer brought her an envelope on a silver dish. A few seconds later, far away in New Delhi, Defense Minister Krishna Menon, acting on his own initiative, during Nehru's absence at the Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference, took the momentous decision to use force if necessary against the Chinese army on the Himalayan frontier. The Chinese must be ejected from the Thag La Ridge, Mr. Menon said while my mother tore open a telegram. No weakness will be shown. But this decision was a mere trifle when set beside the implications of my mother's cable, because while the eviction operation, codenamed Leghorn, was doomed to fail, and eventually to turn India into that most macabre of theatres, the theatre of war, the cable was to plunge me secretly but surely towards the crisis which would end with my final eviction from my own inner world. While the Indian XXX and I Corps were acting on instructions passed from Menon to General Thapar, too, had been placed in great danger, as if unseen forces had decided that I had also overstepped the boundaries of what I was permitted to do or know or be, as though history had decided to put me firmly in my place. I was left entirely without a say in the matter, my mother read the telegram, burst into tears and said, children, we're going home. After which, as I began by saying in another context, it was only a matter of time. What the telegram said, please come quick Sine Sahib suffered HRTBOOT gravely ill Salam's Alice Pereira. Of course, go at once, my darling, my Aunt Emerald told her sister, but what, my God, can be this heart boot? It is possible, even probable, that I am only the first historian to write the story of my undeniably exceptional life and times. Those who follow in my footsteps will, however, inevitably come to this present work, this source book, this hadith or Purana or Grundris, for guidance and inspiration. I say to these future exegetes, when you come to examine the events which followed on from the heart boot cable, remember that at the very eye of the hurricane which was unleashed upon me the sword, to switch metaphors, with which the coup de grace was applied there lay a single unifying force. I refer to telecommunications. Telegrams, and after telegrams, telephones, were my undoing, generously, however, I shall accuse nobody of conspiracy, although it would be easy to believe that the controllers of communication had resolved to regain their monopoly of the nation's airwaves. I must return, Padma is frowning, to the banal chain of cause and effect, we arrived at Santa Cruz Airport, by Dakota, on September 16, but to explain the telegram, I must go further back in time. If Alice Pereira had once sinned, by stealing Joseph de Costa from her sister Mary, she had in these latter years gone a long way towards attaining redemption, because for four years she had been Ahmed Sinai's only human companion. Isolated on the dusty hillock which had once been Methwold's estate, she had borne enormous demands on her accommodating good nature. 
He would make her sit with him until midnight while he drank gins and ranted about the injustices of his life. He remembered, after years of forgetfulness, his old dream of translating and reordering the Quran, and blamed his family for emasculating him so that he didn't have the energy to begin such a task. In addition, because she was there, his anger often directed itself at her, taking the form of long tirades filled with gutter oaths and the useless curses he had devised in the days of his deepest abstraction. She attempted to be understanding, he was a lonely man, his once infallible relationship with the telephone had been destroyed by the economic vagaries of the times, his touch in financial matters had begun to desert him, he fell prey, too, to strange fears. When the Chinese road in the Aksai Chin region was discovered, he became convinced that the yellow hordes would be arriving at Methwold's estate in a matter of days. And it was Alice who comforted him with ice-cold Coca-Cola, saying, no good worrying. Those chinkies are too little to beat our jawans. Better you drink your coke, nothing is going to change. In the end he wore her out, she stayed with him, finally, only because she demanded and received large pay increases, and sent much of the money to Goa, for the support of her sister Mary, but on September 1st, she, too, succumbed to the blandishments of the telephone. By then, she spent as much time on the instrument as her employer, particularly when the Narlikar women called up. The formidable Narlikars were, at that time, besieging my father, telephoning him twice a day, coaxing and persuading him to sell, reminding him that his position was hopeless, flapping around his head like vultures around a burning go-down. On September 1st, like a long-ago vulture, they flung down an arm which slapped him in the face, because they bribed Alice Pereira away from him. Unable to stand him any more, she cried, answer your own telephone. I'm off. That night, Ahmed Sinai's heart began to bulge. Over full of hate resentment self-pity grief, it became swollen like a balloon, it beat too hard, skipped beats, and finally felled him like an ox. At the Breach Candy Hospital the doctors discovered that my father's heart had actually changed shape a new swelling had pushed lumpily out of the lower left ventricle. It had, to use Alice's word, booted. Alice found him the next day, when, by chance, she returned to collect a forgotten umbrella, like a good secretary, she enlisted the power of telecommunications, telephoning an ambulance and telegramming us. Owing to censorship of the mails between India and Pakistan, the heart boot cable took a full week to reach Amina Sinai, back to bomb. I yelled happily, alarming airport coolies. Back to born. I cheered, despite everything, until the newly sober Jamila said, Oh, Salim, honestly, shoo. Alice Pereira met us at the airport, a telegram had alerted her, and then we were in a real Bombay black and yellow taxi, and I was wallowing in the sounds of hot chana hot hawkers, the throng of camels bicycles and people people people, thinking how Mumbadevi's city made Rawalpindi look like a village, rediscovering especially the colors, the forgotten vividness of Gulmoor and Bougainvillea, the livid green of the waters of the Mahalakshmi temple, tank, the stark black and white of the traffic policemen's sun umbrellas and the blue and yellowness of their uniforms, but most of all the blue 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 of the sea, only the grey of my father's stricken face distracted me from the rainbow riot of the city, and made me sober up. Alice Pereira left us at the hospital and went off to work for the Narlikar women, and now a remarkable thing happened. My mother Amina Sinai, jerked out of lethargy and depression and guilt fogs and veruca pain by the sight of my father, seemed miraculously to regain her youth, with all her old gifts of assiduity restored, she set about the rehabilitation of Ahmed, driven by an unstoppable will. She brought him home to the first-floor bedroom in which she had nursed him through the freeze, she sat with him day and night, pouring her strength into his body. And her love had its reward, 
because not only did Ahmed Sinai make a recovery so complete as to astound Breach Candy's European doctors, but also an altogether more wonderful change occurred, which was that, as Ahmed came to himself under Amina's care, he returned and not to the self which had practiced curses and wrestled jinns, but to the self he might always have been, filled with contrition and forgiveness and laughter and generosity and the finest miracle of all, which was love. Ahmed Sinai had, at long last, fallen in love with my mother. And I was the sacrificial lamb with which they anointed their love. They had even begun to sleep together again, and although my sister with a flash of her old monkey self said, in the same bed, Allah, Mimi, how dirty, I was happy for them, and even, briefly, happier for myself, because I was back in the land of the Midnight Children's Conference. While newspaper headlines marched towards war, I renewed my acquaintance with my miraculous fellows, not knowing how many endings were in store for me. On October 9th Indian Army poised for all-out effort I felt able to convene the conference, time and my own efforts had erected the necessary barrier around Mary's secret. Back into my head they came, it was a happy night, a night for burying old disagreements, for making our own all-out effort at reunion. We repeated, over and over again, our joy at being back together, ignoring the deeper truth that we were like all families, that family reunions are more delightful in prospect than in reality and that the time comes when all families must go their separate ways. On October 15th unprovoked attack on INDI the questions I'd been dreading and trying not to provoke began, why is Shiva not here? And, why have you closed off part of your mind? On October 20th, the Indian forces were defeated thrashed by the Chinese at Thag La Ridge. An official Peking statement announced, in self-defense, Chinese frontier guards were compelled to strike back resolutely. But when, that same night, the Children of Midnight launched a concerted assault on me, I had no defense. They attacked on a broad front and from every direction, accusing me of secrecy, prevarication, high-handedness, egotism, my mind, no longer a parliament chamber, became the battleground on which they annihilated me. No longer, Big Brother Salim, I listened helplessly while they tore me apart, because, despite all their sound and fury, I could not unblock what I had sealed away, I could not bring myself to tell them Mary's secret. Even Parvati the witch, for so long my fondest supporter, lost patience with me at last. Oh, Salim, she said, God knows what that Pakistan has done to you, but you are badly changed. Once, long ago, the death of Mian Abdullah had destroyed another conference, which had been held together purely by the strength of his will. Now, as the Midnight Children lost faith in me, they also lost their belief in the thing I had made for them. Between October 20th and November 2 off, I continued to convene to attempt to convene our nightly sessions, but they fled from me, not one by one, but in tens and twenties, each night, less of them were willing to tune in, each week, over a hundred of them retreated into private life. In the high Himalayas, Gurkhas and Rajputs fled in disarray from the Chinese army, and in the upper reaches of my mind, another army was also destroyed by things bickerings, prejudices, boredom, selfishness which I had believed too small, too petty to have touched them. But optimism, like a lingering disease, refused to vanish. I continued to believe I continue now that what we had in common would finally have outweighed what drove us apart. No, I will not accept the ultimate responsibility for the end of the children's conference, because what destroyed all possibility of renewal was the love of Ahmed and Amina Sinai. And Shiva. Shiva, whom I cold-bloodedly denied his birthright. Never once, in that last month, did I send my thoughts in search of him, but his existence, somewhere in the world, nagged away at the corners of my mind. Shiva the Destroyer, Shiva Naknis, he became, for me, 
first a stabbing twinge of guilt, then an obsession, and finally, as the memory of his actuality grew dull, he became a sort of principle, he came to represent, in my mind, all the vengefulness and violence and simultaneous love and hate of things in the world, so that even now, when I hear of drowned bodies floating like balloons on the hoogly and exploding when nudged by passing boats, or trains set on fire, or politicians killed, or riots in Orissa or Punjab, it seems to me that the hand of Shiva lies heavily over all these things, dooming us to flounder endlessly amid murder-rape-greed war that Shiva, in short, has made us who we are. He, too, was born on the stroke of midnight, he, like me, was connected to history. The modes of connection if I'm right in thinking they applied to me enabled him, too, to affect the passage of the days. I'm talking as if I never saw him again, which isn't true. But that, of course, must get into the queue like everything else, I'm not strong enough to tell that tale just now. The disease of optimism, in those days, once again attained epidemic proportions, I, meanwhile, was afflicted by an inflammation of the sinuses. Curiously triggered off by the defeat of Thag La Ridge, public optimism about the war grew as fat, and as dangerous, as an overfilled balloon, my long-suffering nasal passages, however, which had been overfilled all their days, finally gave up the struggle against congestion. While parliamentarians poured out speeches about Chinese aggression and the blood of our martyr Jawans, my eyes began to stream with tears, while the nation puffed itself up, convincing itself that the annihilation of the little yellow men was at hand, my sinuses, too, puffed up and distorted a face which was already so startling that Ayub Khan himself had stared at it in open amazement. In the clutches of the optimism disease, Students burned Mao Zedong and Cho Enlai in effigy, with optimism fever on their brows, mobs attacked Chinese shoemakers, curio dealers and restaurateurs. Burning with optimism, the government even interned Indian citizens of Chinese descent now enemy aliens in camps in Rajasthan. Birla Industries donated a miniature rifle range to the nation, schoolgirls began to go on military parade. But I, Salim, felt as if I was about to die of asphyxiation. The air, thickened by optimism, refused to enter my lungs. Ahmed and Amina Sinai were amongst the worst victims of the renewed disease of optimism, having already contracted it through the medium of their newborn love, they entered into the public enthusiasm with a will. When Mirarji Desai, the urine-drinking finance minister, launched his ornaments for armaments appeal, my mother handed over gold bangles and emerald earrings, when Mirarji floated an issue of defense bonds, Ahmed Sinai bought them in bushels. War, it seemed, had brought a new dawn to India, in the Times of India, a cartoon captioned, War with China, showed Nehru looking at graphs labeled emotional integration, industrial peace, and, people's faith in government and crying, we never had it so good. Adrift in the sea of optimism, we the nation, my parents, I floated blindly towards the reefs. As a people, we are obsessed with correspondences. Similarities between this and that, between apparently unconnected things, make us clap our hands delightedly when we find them out. It is a sort of national longing for form or perhaps simply an expression of our deep belief that forms lie hidden within reality, that meaning reveals itself only in flashes. Hence our vulnerability to omens, when the Indian flag was first raised, for instance, a rainbow appeared above that Delhi field, a rainbow of saffron and green, and we felt blessed. Born amidst correspondence, I have found it continuing to hound me, while Indians headed blindly towards a military debacle, too, was nearing, and entirely without knowing it, a catastrophe of my own. Times of India cartoons spoke of emotional integration, in Buckingham Villa, last remnant of Methwold's estate, 
emotions had never been so integrated. Ahmed and Amina spent their days like just courting youngsters, and while the Peking people's daily complained, the Nehru government has finally shed its cloak of non-alignment, neither my sister nor I were complaining, because for the first time in years we did not have to pretend we were non-aligned in the war between our parents. What war had done for India, the cessation of hostilities had achieved on our two-story hillock. Ahmed Sinai had even given up his nightly battle with the jinns. By November 1st Indians attack under cover of artillery my nasal passages were in a state of acute crisis. Although my mother subjected me to daily torture by Vicks inhaler and steaming bowls of Vicks ointment dissolved in water, which, blanket overhead, I was obliged to try and inhale, my sinuses refused to respond to treatment. This was the day on which my father held out his arms to me and said, Come, son come here and let me love you. In a frenzy of happiness, maybe the optimism disease had got to me, after all, I allowed myself to be smothered in his squashy belly, but when he let me go, nose goo had stained his bush shirt. I think that's what finally doomed me, because that afternoon, my mother went on to the attack. Pretending to me that she was telephoning a friend, she made a certain telephone call. While Indians attacked under cover of artillery, Amina Sinai planned my downfall, protected by a lie. Before I describe my entry into the desert of my later years, however, I must admit the possibility that I have grievously wronged my parents. Never once, to my knowledge, Never once in all the time since Mary Pereira's revelations, did they set out to look for the true son of their blood, and I have, at several points in this narrative, ascribed this failure to a certain lack of imagination I have said, more or less, that I remained their son because they could not imagine me out of the role. And there are worse interpretations possible, too such as their reluctance to accept into their bosom an urchin who had spent eleven years in the gutter, but I wish to suggest a nobler motive, maybe, despite everything, despite cucumber nose stain face chinlessness horn temples bandy legs finger loss monk stauncher and my, admittedly unknown to them, bad left ear, despite even the midnight baby swap of Mary Pereira, maybe, I say, in spite of all these provocations, my parents loved me. I withdrew from them into my secret world, fearing their hatred, I did not admit the possibility that their love was stronger than ugliness, stronger even than blood. It is certainly likely that what a telephone call arranged, what finally took place on November 21, 1962, was done for the highest of reasons, that my parents ruined me for love. The day of November 20th was a terrible day, the night was a terrible night, six days earlier. On Nehru's 73rd birthday, the great confrontation with the Chinese forces had begun, the Indian Army Jawan swing into action, had attacked the Chinese at Walong. News of the disaster of Walong, and the rout of General Call and four battalions, reached Nehru on Saturday 18th, on Monday 20th, it flooded through radio and press and arrived at Methwold's estate. Ultimate Panic in New Delhi Indian forces in tatters. That day the last day of my old life I sat huddled with my sister and parents around our Telefunken radiogram, while telecommunications struck the fear of God and China into our hearts. And my father now said a fateful thing, wife, he intoned gravely, while Jamila and I shook with fear, Begum Sahiba, this country is finished. Bankrupt. Funtush. The evening paper proclaimed the end of the optimism disease, public morale drains away. And after that end, there were others to come, other things would also drain away. I went to bed with my head full of Chinese faces guns tanks, but at midnight, my head was empty and quiet, because the midnight conference had drained away as well. The only one of the magic children who was willing to talk to me was Parvati the witch, and we, dejected utterly by what Nussie the duck would have called, the end of the world, 
were unable to do more than simply commune in silence. And other, more mundane drainages, a crack appeared in the mighty Bakranungal hydroelectric dam, and the great reservoir behind it flooded through the fissure, and the Narlikar Women's Reclamation Consortium, impervious to optimism or defeat or anything except the lure of wealth, continued to draw land out of the depths of the seas, but the final evacuation, the one which truly gives this episode its title, took place the next morning, just when I had relaxed and thought that something, after all, might turn out all right, because in the morning we heard the improbably joyous news that the Chinese had suddenly, without needing to, stopped advancing, having gained control of the Himalayan heights, they were apparently content, ceasefire. The newspapers screamed, and my mother almost fainted in relief. There was talk that General Call had been taken prisoner, the President of India, Dr. Radhakrishnan, commented, unfortunately, this report is completely untrue. Despite streaming eyes and puffed up sinuses, I was happy, despite even the end of the children's conference, I was basking in the new glow of happiness which permeated Buckingham Villa, so when my mother suggested, let's go and celebrate. A picnic, children, you'd like that. I naturally agreed with alacrity. It was the morning of November 21st, we helped make sandwiches and parathas, we stopped at a fizzy drinks shop and loaded ice in a tin tub and cokes in a crate into the boot of our rover, parents in the front, children in the back, we set off. Jamila Singer sang for us as we drove. Through inflamed sinuses, I asked, where are we going? Juhu. Elephanta. Marv. Where? And my mother, smiling awkwardly, surprise, wait and see. Through streets filled with relieved, rejoicing crowds we drove. This is the wrong way, I exclaimed, this isn't the way to a beach. My parents both spoke at once, reassuringly, brightly, just one stop first, and then we're off, promise. Telegrams recalled me, radiograms frightened me, but it was a telephone which booked the date time place of my undoing, and my parents lied to me. We halted in front of an unfamiliar building in Karnak Road. Exterior, crumbling. All its windows, blind. You coming with me, son? Ahmed Sinai got out of the car, I, happy to be accompanying my father on his business, walked jauntily beside him. A brass plate on the doorway, ear nose throat clinic. And I, suddenly alarmed, what's this, Abba? Why have we come? And my father's hand, tightening on my shoulder and then a man in a white coat and nurses in, ah yes Mr. Sinai so this is young Salim right on time fine, fine, while I, Abba, know what about the picnic dash, but doctors are steering me along now, my father is dropping back, the man in the coat calls to him, shan't be long damn good news about the war, no? And the nurse, please accompany me for dressing and anesthesia. Tricked. Tricked, Padma. I told you, once, picnics tricked me, and then there was a hospital and a room with a hard bed and bright hanging lamps and me crying, no no no, and the nurse, don't be stupid now, you're almost a grown man, lie down, and I, remembering how nasal passages had started everything in my head, how nasal fluid had been sniffed up 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 into somewhere that nose fluid shouldn't go, how that the connection had been made which released my voices, was kicking yelling so that they had to hold me down. Honestly, the nurse said, such a baby, I never saw. And so what began in a washing chest ended on an operating table, because I was held down hand and foot in a man saying, you won't feel a thing, easier than having your tonsils out, get those sinuses fixed in no time, complete clear out, and meet no please no, but the voice continued, I'll put this mask on you now, just count to ten. Count. The numbers marching one two three. 
Hiss of released gas. The numbers crushing me 456. Faces swimming in fog. And still the tumultuous numbers, I was crying, I think, the numbers pounding 789. 10. Good God, the boy's still conscious. Extraordinary. We'd better try another can you hear me? Salim, isn't it? Good chap, just give me another 10. Can't catch me. Multitudes have teamed inside my head. The master of the numbers, me. Here they go again, Laven 12. But they'll never let up until 13, 14, 15. Oh God, oh God, the fog dizzy and falling back, back, back. 16, beyond war and pepper pots, back, back. 17, 18, 19. When there was a washing chest and a boy who sniffed too hard. His mother undressed and revealed a black mango. Voices came, which were not the voices of archangels. A hand, deafening the left ear. And what grew best in the heat, fantasy, irrationality, lust. There was a clock tower refuge, and cheatery in class. And love in Bombay caused a bicycle accident, horn temples entered forcep hollows, and 581 children visited my head. Midnight's children, who may have been the embodiment of the hope of freedom, who may also have been freaks who ought to be finished off. Parvati the witch, most loyal of all, and Shiva, who became a principle of life. There was a question of purpose, and the debate between ideas and things. There were knees and nos and nos and knees. Quarrels began, and the adult world infiltrated the children's, there was selfishness and snobbishness and hate. And the impossibility of a third principle, the fear of coming to nothing after all began to grow. And what nobody said, that the purpose of the 581 lay in their destruction, that they had come, in order to come to nothing. Prophecies were ignored when they spoke to this effect. And revelations, and the closing of a mind, and exile, and four years after return, suspicions growing, dissension breeding, departures in twenties and tens. And, at the end, just one voice left, but optimism lingered what we had in common retained the possibility of overpowering what forced us apart. Until, silence outside me. A dark room, blinds down. Can't see anything, nothing there to see. Silence inside me. A connection broken, forever. Can't hear anything, nothing there to hear. Silence, like a desert. And a clear, free nose, nasal passages full of air. Air, like a vandal, invading my private places. Drained. I have been drained. The Parahamsa, grounded. For good. Oh, spell it out, spell it out. The operation whose ostensible purpose was the draining of my inflamed sinuses and the once and for all clearing of my nasal passages had the effect of breaking whatever connection had been made in a washing chest of depriving me of nose-given telepathy, of banishing me from the possibility of midnight children. Our names contain our fates, living as we do in a place where names have not acquired the meaninglessness of the West, and are still more than mere sounds, we are also the victims of our titles. Sinai contains Ibn Sina, master magician, Sufi adept, and also Sin the Moon, the ancient god of Hadramaut, with his own mode of connection, his powers of action at a distance upon the tides of the world. But sin is also the letter S, as sinuous as a snake, serpents lie coiled within the name. And there is also the accident of transliteration Sinai, when in Roman script, though not in Nastalic, is also the name of the place of revelation, of put off thy shoes, of commandments and golden calves, but when all that is said and done, when Ibn Sina is forgotten and the moon has set, 
when snakes lie hidden and revelations end. It is the name of the desert of barrenness, infertility, dust, the name of the end. In Arabia Arabia deserta at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, other prophets also preached, Maslama of the tribe of the Banu Hanifa in the Yamama, the very heart of Arabia, and Hanzala ibn Safwan, and Khalid ibn Sinan. Maslama's God was Ar Rahman, the merciful, today Muslims pray to Allah, Ar Rahman. Khalid ibn Sinan was sent to the tribe of Pabs, for a time, he was followed, but then he was lost. Prophets are not always false simply because they are overtaken, and swallowed up, by history. Men of worth have always roamed the desert. Wife, Ahmed Sinai said, this country is finished. After ceasefire and drainage, these words returned to haunt him, and Amina began to persuade him to emigrate to Pakistan, where her surviving sisters already were, and to which her mother would go after her father's death. A fresh start, she suggested, Janum, it would be lovely. What is left for us on this godforsaken hill? So in the end Buckingham Villa was delivered into the clutches of the Narlikar women, after all, and over 15 years late, my family moved to Pakistan, the land of the pure. Ahmed Sinai left very little behind, there are ways of transmitting money with the help of multinational companies, and my father knew those ways. And I, although sad to leave the city of my birth, was not unhappy about moving away from the city in which Shiva lurked somewhere like a carefully concealed landmine. We left Bombay, finally, in February 1963, and on the day of our departure I took an old tin globe down to the garden and buried it amongst the cacti. Inside it, a prime minister's letter, and a jumbo-sized front-page baby snap, captioned Midnight's Child. They may not be holy relics I do not presume to compare the trivial memorabilia of my life with the Hazratbal hair of the Prophet, or the body of St. Francis Xavier in the Cathedral of Bill M. Jesus but they are all that has survived of my past, a squashed tin globe, a mildewed letter, a photograph. Nothing else, not even a silver spittoon. Apart from a monkey-crushed planet, the only records are sealed in the closed books of heaven, Sejin and Ilian, the books of evil and good, at any rate, that's the story. Only when we were aboard SS Sabarmati, and anchored off the ran of Kutch, did I remember old Skopstecker, and wondered, suddenly, if anyone had told him we were going. I didn't dare to ask, for fear that the answer might be no, so as I thought of the demolition crew getting to work, and pictured the machines of destruction smashing into my father's office and my own blue room, pulling down the servant's spiral iron staircase and the kitchen in which Mary Pereira had stirred her fears into chutneys and pickles, massacring the veranda where my mother had sat with the child in her belly like a stone. I AKO had an image of a mighty, swinging ball crashing into the domain of sharp sticker Sahib, and of the old crazy man himself, pale wasted flick tongued, being exposed there on top of a crumbling house, amid falling towers and red tiled roof, old Skopstecker shriveling aging dying in the sunlight which he hadn't seen for so many years. But perhaps I'm dramatizing, I may have got all this from an old film called Lost Horizon, in which beautiful women shriveled and died when they departed from Shangri-La. For every snake, there is a ladder, for every ladder, a snake. We arrived in Karachi on February 9th and within months, my sister Jamila had been launched on the career which would earn her the names of Pakistan's angel and Bulbul of the faith, we had left Bombay, but we gained reflected glory. And one more thing, although I had been drained although no voices spoke in my head, and never would again there was one compensation, namely that, for the first time in my life, I was discovering the astonishing delights of possessing a sense of smell. If you like this video please like share and subscribe.